you guys very much. This is a great conference. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, so before I introduce myself a bit, let me talk a little bit about these ticks because a bunch of you might be wondering what these are. Um, so these are essentially, you know, a GPU on a USB stick. Uh, I jokingly say the word GPU because that's what people know, uh, but it's actually a VPU. It's a visual processing unit. So what you typically do is you train a model uh, in TensorFlow or CAFE, and uh, you deploy that model, uh, you know, to this USB stick, and uh, this will basically take a live video stream and then identify objects in the video stream. So one common application would be like a smart security camera. The chip itself is actually very tiny. It's about the size of, of, of a pinky nail. And these will go inside smart cameras, drones, um, you know, smart trucks, and all sorts of uh, Internet of Things kind of uh, you know, applications. So that's what you guys have. You guys all have the power of AI basically in your hand today. Uh, we handed you, uh, you know, a pretty powerful USB device. It's uh, extremely low power. It's uh, basically, I think, like two to five watts. So you know, it can run easily on battery power without um, you know, draining down your battery all day. With that said, let me just have a brief word on a couple Intel hardware offerings. Uh, you know, obviously, many of you guys know about the uh, you know, i7, i5 series. You know, those are uh, chips that you have in your laptop today. What many of you may not know is, uh, guess what the most popular AI processor is in the world today? Guess who makes that? So I'll give you a hint, you're looking at it. Um, so most of you may not realize, uh, but you know, pretty much every laptop, you know, every laptop has Intel in it, and alongside the Intel CPU is also an Intel GPU. And then Intel GPU is capable of doing things that this uh, stick is capable of doing. We're enabling that via software uh, called OpenVINO, and uh, we're making OpenCL bindings you know, for things like TensorFlow and CAFE, which will allow you to train using the GPU that you already own. Now, also, we have a number of the Xeon processors, which are used in data centers, you know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. They all use Xeon. They just have a whole bunch of them. And just because they have a ton of these lying around, uh, you know, it's, very, it's pretty much the most popular inference processor out there today. Uh, now, training is another matter, but you know, for inference, which is like 80, 90 percent of the market, uh, Xeon is involved, and uh, Xeon, in fact, actually uh, scores fairly well in terms of uh, you know inference latency, uh, you know, cost per inference, and uh, a bunch of other metrics. If you look at the Stanford Don Bench benchmarks, so I just wanted to point out that yeah, a lot of you already own basically a GPU today. It's already in your laptop. You guys just got a Movidius, and uh, you know, there's basically Xeon in the cloud, and you guys are already using Intel for AI if you're not aware of it. So that's why you know, we have this presentation talking a little bit about how Intel is optimizing AI. Uh, you know, because we have such a wide user base, we have to make sure this is fast and efficient for everyone. So with that said, I want to challenge you guys, you know, just kind of think about this as we're giving the talk. You know, what are the metrics that matter? You know, everyone talks about raw performance. You, know, you hear some GPU companies out there saying, yeah, we have raw massive performance and all that. But then you have some other customers you know, asking for things like you know, performance per watt. If I put this on a cell phone or a drone, you know, how much of my battery does this eat up, right? especially in a self-driving car? How many miles fewer do I get on a self-driving car because I'm using too much power? And then also performance per dollar. You know, think about if I already have an existing uh, installation base, if I already own a laptop, how much more do I have to spend to get that kind of performance? So think about that. Think about what kinds of hardware uh, you, know, you would design to do such a thing in the context of the talk. So with that said, I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, so as I was introduced already, uh, basically been teaching the deep learning class out at Northwestern for the last three years. I booted it up out of the data science program roughly around the time that Malone was founded. So 2016 was a magical year where a lot of you know, such classes got uh, booted up and uh, you know, companies got started. Uh, since then, um, you know, I've also done a, a postdoc at Stanford. That's when I got, you know, cut my teeth doing machine learning. I had no business of doing that in 2011. Uh, I graduated with a security PhD and uh, this machine learning thing seemed kind of cool, so never took a machine learning course in my life. I just kind of poked around and uh, much like you guys, you know, read some books, figured it out. Eventually, I found a faculty position at Northwestern. So I'll basically turn the uh, mic over to a much more experienced professor, uh, Professor Jude Chavlik. He's been a machine learning professor for 30 years, long before it was cool and what people recognized machine learning was. So, <laughs> so let me give you the mic. The undergrad arrived in 1975, which um, I was thinking earlier today is, is like going backwards the other direction that 40 some years. When I was an undergrad, and someone said, Oh, I was at MIT in 1933. That's what it would be like for if you guys are undergrads. You know, that's the same delta, which is kind of weird for me to think about. But the time flies, and I still think in a lot of parts of my head, I think I'm 27 yet or something. So, uh, so you know, enjoy life and uh, don't rush to get older. Probably know that by now. Uh, so I, I actually re retired from Wisconsin uh, about a year ago and we moved to New York City. So I, but I'm doing some consulting with uh, Intel for the last uh, two or three months now, four months maybe, also with uh, a small spin off from the University of Wisconsin, kind of an AI 
I should put to, uh, to the resource. And um, I, I don't have a whole lot to say here. Uh, well, I have two points. This is my only slide. That, um, you know, in the history of AI, every decade, more or less, there's been a new major algorithm that, uh, like now it's deep learning, support vector machines, graphical model, decision trees, uh, whatnot. So, uh, you know, don't think the current thing, all these old things are irrelevant, and the current thing is going to be it, and it's the only thing you need to know for it. Look at general aspects of machine learning. Look at the tasks, not necessarily, I mean, you have to look at the techniques to solve the tasks, but separate, it takes a while to appreciate this if you don't already, but there's tasks and there's techniques, and many techniques can, can address the same task, and, and, and sort of the vice versa too, I won't go into that too much. So, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, will deep networks, how long will it be the king of the hill? I think one thing that's different, there's a big industry behind machine learning now for essentially the first time. We were the AI expert system when I was a grad student, but this is a mini industry. It wasn't anything like things today. And that gives a lot of momentum or something, I guess. You know, that's why we still use C or relational databases or a lot of these other fields. AI, yeah, for a long time, we had the advantage of machine learning in particular to not have all that steering the Titanic or something, or the Queen Mary or something that's still in sync. And um, we didn't have that. We could switch around quick. And now it's harder to do that. Although I was talking to the guy at the Amazon desk. He said, at Amazon, you know, they think they're going to change and they're trying to prepare to be ready for new tech, either an old one becoming more powerful, great in boosting trees or something, or a new one that we don't know about coming out. So that's my editorial there. Uh, I've always used. We had to say that Wisconsin was sort of a cloud thing. And probably in 1988, I ran experiments using more machine learning cycles than anyone else in the world. Uh, but that was people in machine learning. You made the AWS in 88, right? It probably would run in two minutes on your laptop that we ran for years. But um, uh, if you want to talk to me more about breath, about grad school, uh, I, I, I was at Wisconsin did research for 30 years, talk about that, or you know, uh, feel free. But uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, maybe two points I didn't put on, but I thought of it today. One, experiment to methodology is real important. It's easy to get good train, relatively easy to get good train set performance. Be careful, don't tune your parameters on the data you really evaluate with later because you're going to fool yourself. Many, many times I got great tune set accuracies and I could never, in a fair way, find those models and find other ones, but they were substantially worse. So, so watch for that. And uh, my other point is, as you get old, you can only remember one point. So uh, I, I have it down, but I, 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 of course, I use memory aids when you get older. I sent myself an email of it during an earlier talk, but I can't, I can't remember now. So if I think of it, I'll squeeze it in later. And I'll, I'll pass the, the mic back to, uh, to Alec here. And uh, if any quick questions for me, well, I'm holding the mic, I could answer them. Otherwise, uh, we'll go to his technical talk. And the work he's talking about is all his work. and. Uh, I'm, I'm just a bystander. Well, I love her to talk already. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jude. Uh, great perspectives on history. Um, you know, when I was a postdoc at Stanford, first getting started in machine learning, these were things that I couldn't even run on my laptop. I had to run them on gigantic server workstations. And uh, it's, it makes me so proud that we can just hand this away on a USB stick nowadays. Uh, technology has come a long way. So uh, just a quick word about the AI Academy before we start the talk. Um, the AI Academy is really Intel's attempt to help everyone get started in AI and uh, you know produce great things with AI. So, starting with these sticks, you know we've had people build uh, sentry fire detectors. You know they were looking at video feeds of fires and uh, they can detect that hey, there's a fire here. We should call the fire department. Another innovator has uh, built a clean water detector. They hooked it up to a microscope and uh, looked for bacteria in the water. And uh, in real time, you can see the video and identify the bacteria species in the water. So a lot of cool things have been done with this. We also provide um, you know basically uh, research grants for the professors and. Uh, we work with a lot of the top um, uh, professors around the world, uh, publishing at great AI conferences, and um, we provide curriculum as well. So if you guys need to get a head start and uh, you know want to look at some um, PowerPoint slides and uh, resources for AI, you know please go to software.intel.com/ai, and that's basically the organization that I'm running. Um, I've only been around Intel for six months. I spent three years teaching, and uh, that's only a tenth of the time that he has. Um, and the program itself has only been around for about one and a half months. So I think uh, we're still learning a lot of things. We're still learning a lot about your needs, 
obviously a lot of you guys are very advanced and already building models and have questions about you know how to optimize those models. So you know, please bring those ideas back to me and uh, we'll see how we can improve the academy to meet your needs better. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about AI performance under the hood. Who likes to wait for their machine learning model to train? Anyone like waiting? So you like to wait. Why, why do you like to wait? <laughs> it does, okay, yeah. We'll take that time away from you, okay? <laughs> um, you know, at Intel, we're always looking at AI at scale. And, uh, you know, actually, I think just last year, we set a, a record, a world record for training ResNet 50. We were able to do it on, like, hundreds and hundreds of CPUs uh, with Berkeley and uh, trained it in just about 30 minutes. So I want you guys to think a little bit past just single node performance, right? I, I want to talk about single node performance today. But think about AI at the data center scale, because it's pretty clear, you know, we can't stuff more GPUs and more accelerators in a box anymore. Some of them are getting up to eight of them, and uh, eventually at some time you're just going to trip the fuse. So you have to think about how to distribute these things. So with that said, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're optimizing AI at the node level, and then hopefully that'll apply to the, uh, the distributed data center uh, level. You know, as you speed up the nodes, the whole data center itself gets faster. With that said, I'm required to have the slide here. It's just a bunch of legal disclaimer stuff. Um, Basically, it means that we gave you a USB stick, don't sue us for it. <laughs> um, we hope it works. <laughs> so with that said, I'm going to review a couple basic ideas about TensorFlow, talk about where some basic AI training and inference bottleneck can be. Uh, these are not ideas that are unique to Intel. Actually, they affect just about every hardware that is out there, um, almost all current architecture. So I kind of want you guys to view it from a, a wider point perspective where you know, these are fundamental um, issues uh, as you're training a network as the word bottlenecks can appear in the training process itself. So at Intel, uh, you know, we make hardware. Uh, we're pretty agnostic to software. Our big goal is to pretty much support all the software frameworks uh, to use Intel optimized AI. In the new Intel uh, Skylake and Cascade Lake processors, we have a lot of vector uh, neural network extensions. So we're taking on some things that GPUs do very well, and we're put, making them integral to the CPU. Uh, so a lot of these are you know, basically in neural networks and training and deep learning and all that. It's basically all just matrix multiplies and convolutions, right? So once we implement them once in our framework called the Math Kernel Library, MKL, it's simply just plugging them into the frameworks. Uh, that's kind of the, you know, the zeroth order optimization. But as you'll see throughout the talk, there's actually quite a few more things that we can do uh, to speed it up quite a bit. So you know, we, have, we actually have pretty uh, reasonable speeds um, in training now, uh, 14x uh, speed up in training. Uh, the Skylake processors are far faster than the previous generation. And uh, in inference, we're actually doing pretty well. So if you look at Stanford Dawn Bench, we're winning in terms of inference latencies. We're winning in terms of uh, performance per dollar. So, you know, on a couple of these metrics, we're making great improvements. And I think, uh, you know, there's still some ways to go, but we're doing much better today. So let's just review, you know, technically uh, what basically deep learning AI is. Essentially, there's two phases. One of them is training and one of them is inference. In the training phase, you basically feed a bunch of labeled uh, data points into the neural network. And basically, these uh, training points run a forward pass through the network, and then they make a prediction. Sometimes that prediction is right, sometimes it's wrong. So in this case, uh, we fed in a strawberry, but it predicted bicycle. Uh, and then when it's wrong, there's basically an error derivative. And then based on that error, you backpropagate through the network, and then you correct the weights uh, such that you learn how to predict better the next time. And then, of course, once you're done doing this many, many times, uh, it takes many, many hours to train such a thing. Uh, you basically deploy it onto a, uh, an inference network, much like what you would have with one of these Blavidia sticks that we've been giving out. Uh, and that's basically how the AI stuff works. Uh, I think 90% or so of the market is really inference. Uh, few people already train, except for the researchers, uh, but for the vast majority of you know, consumers, it's going to be inference. And uh, one thing to note in this is actually that inference is actually a subset of training. So in order to get training, you have to do the forward pass. So any advancement, any kind of optimization that you can make on the inference side will also speed up the training side as well. Uh, go ahead. Could you say something about those things that are uh, uh, <coughs> horizontal levels and the interactions? Could it be five or is three an important number? Could it be seven? Uh, so this is just for you know exposition on the PowerPoint slide. Actual neural networks have a much, much wider layers. So they're much deeper and much wider in an actual neural network. It's just you know what looks nice on a PowerPoint. This is probably more like a 1980s size neural network, I would say, <laughs> about what you could train. Yeah. Why do we wear 100 wide? Yeah, you like know, don't think deep yeah. means deep thinking. Deep could have been called wide. It just isn't as sexy of a term. So you're really working on wide learning if you draw your pictures this way. So, so it's a coincidence. What's this dimension versus this dimension? 
So the depth here, yeah. if you look at it, you know, in terms of uh, convolutions, uh, there's an idea of what's called a receptive field. So when you do many convolutions deeply, it ends up seeing a wider area of the um, of the image, and it's an efficient way to basically represent uh, the neural network without a lot of width. So actually, they could be somewhat, you know, equivalent if you have an infinitely wide network that's almost equivalent to a, like a deep network. Uh, but the it's exponential in that d dimension. That's why you know having the depth makes it much more efficient. Does that somewhat answer your question? Um, so usually I answer that in like lecture five out of my ten. So, so yeah, you're quite ahead of the, you know if you're asking a question you know quite deep in the lecture. So. So the fundamental idea behind this is, uh, you know, there's what's called a computation graph, and this is uh, common to things like TensorFlow and also PyTorch and the like. Um, this is actually just even like a, a common computing um, construct, right? Basically, it's a data flow. So you have a number of inputs, right? And the inputs flow through to the nodes, and the output of the nodes basically flow through these arrows into operators, right? So like these two inputs feed into the multiply, so maybe a two and a three, and it produces a six, and then that six comes out here with another input here, maybe six plus one maybe produces a seven here. So the edges here basically re represent the data flow. So as these operators emit the output, the edges will carry the output to the next operator. And as I said, like uh, basically these, uh, these data will uh, basically flow through the operators one at a time. Uh, the compiler or the runtime, you know, be it TensorFlow or uh, PyTorch, will basically provide a graph that schedules the operation of these operators such that you produce the final output uh, basically from left to right order. Uh, this is extremely important in the actual execution of the neural network because there's a critical path, right? You know, you can't get faster than basically one, two, three because, you know, there's basically three steps here. And you can also be parallel. So you'll see that some parallelization um, a little bit later in the, today's lecture. So let's talk about performance bottlenecks. So, you know, when we think about deep learning, we think about, you know, things like massive compute, GPUs, lots of cores and all that. Uh, but Deep learning training is actually a lot of things. Um, so first of all, if you look at the most basic, you have to read the data from somewhere, right? You have to read your images or your you know, text files or somewhere from the disk or from the network. And basically, if you cannot read those images fast enough, oftentimes if you don't have an SSD or a fast enough SSD, uh, the utilization of the compute units is going to be low because it's going to be waiting on that disk all the time. So it sounds like a really obvious thing. Um, but when I talked to a, a company, it's a startup in Silicon Valley just uh, two years ago, they were saying, oh, we have all the major deep learning companies as customers. And I was like, well, what do you do? We sell very fast disks. <laughs> it turns out this is a major problem because our compute is uh, way outstripping the speed of our disks. Um, so basically, uh, you know, the way to solve that is you use something called a TensorFlow record, which basically pre-parses the data, uh, or use the TF Data API, or just use more cores to decode. So another funny thing is that um, a lot of times when you're training a neural network, even using a GPU, you still need the CPU to decode it. Or if you're working on encrypted data, you still need something to decrypt it. So there's always you know, some intermediary that's kind of you know, uh, working on the data and pre-processing it before it ever goes to the neural network itself. So another thing is that, you know, most obviously, it requires a huge amount of computation. But the computation is actually a little bit more nuanced than just computation itself. Many of us think that you know, once you have something in RAM, that basically it's free. right? You know, so compared to accessing something from disk, accessing something from memory is super fast. right? Well, that is true. But it turns out that you know, there's a reason, there's a thing called a cache in a processor, right? So a cache access is basically one cycle. You know, it's a very small number of cycles. And uh, a memory access is like you know, dozens or you know, maybe even 100 cycles. So what ends up happening is that you know, if you want to keep the computer completely busy, you know, if you want to get all the flops that you paid for on a CPU or GPU, you want to keep that thing fed as fast as you can, read from the disk as fast as you can. And then the other thing is that oftentimes the models have to be read in from memory. The model itself is about 100 megabytes that has to be pulled in every time. And the CPU cache is only about 40 megabytes, even on, on the largest CPUs. And uh, basically, the memory bandwidth itself becomes a problem because you can't pull the weights in fast enough for the multiplier units on the execution uh, core to basically do its work. So there's going to be some uh, compiler optimizations and uh, framework optimizations that basically help deal with the bandwidth boundedness. But uh, a lot of these workloads are, in fact, bandwidth bound. Uh, one more thing I do want to say is that if you look at different kinds of workloads, right? If you're calculating, say, an exponential or something, right? Oftentimes what happens is that you read in one floating point number and then you multiply it by itself many times, right? So basically the, uh, the ratio of floating point operations to, uh, to basically memory loads or, or stores is basically uh, very high, right? You do a lot of FPU operations per memory address read in. For deep learning and machine learning, not so much, because oftentimes what you're doing is you're basically pulling a data element, you run in the forward pass, 
uh, you know, you compute the activations and then you write it back. So usually that ratio is almost one. So for every, uh, for every floating point that you read in, you do about one operation and then you write it back. So it's, it's an extremely different kind of workload. So just to put this in a kind of stark contrast here is, think about a neural network like a ResNet 50. It, you know, it's a fairly common network that lots of people use. And if you look at it, if you have an input image, uh, the input size is 224 by 224 by 3. Once you read that in from a JPEG or a ping, you, de uh, you basically uh, decode it, and it becomes a bunch of 4-byte, 32-bit uh, floats, right? And then a common batch size for training is usually about 128 images. If you actually work out the mathematics to see how big that is, it's about 73.5 megabytes of storage just for you know, uh, one, you know, uh, one pass. So it doesn't sound like a lot, 73.5 megabytes, no big deal. My laptop's got 16 gigs of RAM, right? So the inputs are not a huge problem. Now, if you look at the, uh, the actual weights of ResNet 50 itself, it's got about 25 million parameters. Uh, usually, if you're using a framework like Keras or, or TensorFlow, you'll download this. And um, the Keras size of this model is about 99 megabytes. So not too bad. You add the two together, it's about 99 plus 70-something uh, you know, megabytes, right? Fits easily into memory, no big deal. So uh, does anyone have any idea how big the activations are in this kind of a network? So each time you have an input, right, you have an activation. Uh, and how many activations do you think would be in this kind of a network? Rough order of magnitude. About a gigabyte. About a gigabyte. Uh, you're close. A little bit bigger. <laughs> close, but still bigger. Right. So how many people have 16 gigabytes of RAM on their laptop? How many people have eight? Eight? OK. So you guys can't even run this. Forget about this one. Your batch size is to be like you know, 16 or something like that, right? <laughs> But even 16 gigabytes of RAM, this is 17.2 gigabytes of RAM, just for the activations alone. And don't forget, you know, when you actually compute the gradients, the gradients are the same size as the, uh, as the weights themselves, right? Because it's one per weight. So we're talking about you know, larger than the size of RAM that most laptops have. I have a 32 gig laptop, so I can fit this bit. But this is certainly not pleasant. And uh, if you think about it, the speed of DDR4 RAM, you know, like 3200, there's different speeds, but it's roughly about 25 gigabytes per second. If you consider that the commands on the bus and all that have some overhead and all that, and uh, the fact that you're reading and writing it back and forth, it's roughly about 20 gigabytes per second. So if you think about this, this takes almost a full second to write all the activations to memory and read them back in. So that's a huge amount of time right there. So memory bandwidth is extremely important. You guys will see later in this lecture that uh, you know, like optimizing for memory bandwidth is one of the keys to getting great deep learning performance. And uh, it's something that's key to anything, not just uh, CPUs, but also GPUs as well. Memory bandwidth is king. So getting a little bit deeper into this, um, you know, just looking at those calculations, it's pretty clear now you know, those floating point units can't be fed fast enough because that RAM simply isn't fast enough, right? So oftentimes, you know, things are memory bound. And as I said, the smallest model that I could find, I think, was like a squeeze net or a mobile net. That was about 17 megabytes. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, the activations are so big, even going down to 17 megabytes won't help you all that much. Uh, the processor cache itself is about like on, a, on the highest end, you know, Intel server CPUs, it's about like 40 megabytes or so. And, you know, on desktop CPUs, it's probably more like eight or so. So, I mean, it's not going to fit into cache anyhow. But there's one thing that hurts even more. Um, so a lot of things, you know, people are doing on single nodes, single CPUs, or maybe a single GPU. When you're on a single, uh, you know, machine, it makes things much simpler. Now, when you need to expand, you need to tie multiple, you know, compute units together. So multiple CPUs on, you know, multiple sockets or multiple GPUs across multiple slots. So what ends up happening is that, you know, this is an extremely difficult model to program. You know, every uh, device can have its own memory, but that makes it very difficult, right? So oftentimes, they give it a uniform memory space, and uh, what they call what they call this is they call it a non-uniform memory access. So each of the Intel CPUs here basically has its own memory controller. There's, uh, there's a pin for every uh, DDR pin. There's a, there's a pin that goes out from the CPU, and that basically makes it very efficient and very fast. Uh, but the problem is that you know, when you have multiple sockets, more than one socket, you know, the memory attached to another chip may be accessed by the other chip and the socket group. And basically, when that happens, it has to basically go across a NUMA bus, and then it has to access the memory from that other CPU. So that costs a little bit more time than just accessing the memory directly attached to your CPU. That is almost, ex well, it's not quite as expensive as going to disk, but it's quite a bit more expensive than touching your own RAM. So a lot of the designs that we have to uh, look at now is that, uh, you know, we actually found that training is a little bit faster when you start two TensorFlow processes, one per socket, you know, just accessing the local RAM and sending the gradients across the, uh, the NUMA bus itself. 
So the solution to this, of course, is that, as I said, you basically, instead of doing this remote access, you basically use processor affinity. You run multiple TensorFlow processes per socket, and then you have them communicate as a distributed system. So, you know, we're even playing tricks, you know, like distributed systems, distributed training tricks, even at the single box level, just because we can cram eight CPUs. You know, we have eight socket boards out there, and we can run eight TensorFlow processes as if it were a cloud, like in a single box. So let's talk a little bit about the operator optimization. So, you know, we said that basically it's an operator graph. You know, it's a data flow graph. Data flows in, goes to the operators, and then gets distributed to the other operators. And uh, the optimizations basically work at multiple levels. We have oper operator optimizations and the operators themselves. We have graph level optimizations for memory bandwidth, and we also have system level optimizations for having many cores. So the operator optimizations are pretty simple. Uh, you guys may be aware of uh, AVX, or you guys may have heard of MMX in the day of the, you know, the bunny suit advertising. Um, the bunny suits have not advertised AVX2 as much, but it's essentially an upgraded version of MMX. It's basically just a vectorized way uh, to operate on uh, you know, arrays of floating point uh, di uh, numbers. It's a lot like what GPUs do, so you know, GPU-like technology, but it's, a, it's been available for a long time in Intel. Uh, with AVX512, we made it bigger. It used to be that you could only do 32 uh, floating point ops uh, you know, per cycle. Now we basically doubled that in AVX512, making it 64. And then in our machines, um, on some of the biggest machines, we have 56 cores. And on each core, we have two of these uh, uh, fuse, uh, fuse multiply add units. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, we have a massive number of multipliers. We have a massive number of FPU units uh, running with uh, you know, these massive vector-sized um, you know, uh, um, data types. So uh, doing that, I think we achieved close to maybe like eight or nine teraflops, which is quite a you know, GPU range. And um, we optimize each of these operators. So you guys may be familiar with the convolutional operator, uh, ReLU, matrix operators, and the like. And uh, we've optimized them to use these vector operations. So they're basically uh, accelerated by doing many of them at once in a batch. Uh, and actually, one more point here. Um, so we did this using a, a library called MKLDNN. Um, so MKL is the math kernel library. It descended from high performance computing. So a lot of the big supercomputers in the world use a lot of Xeon processors. And MKL is basically the way that you multiply gigantic matrices together and get great performance out of that. Uh, so we basically took this fantastic library from scientific computing, downsized it to neural network size, and basically put it inside TensorFlow. And that's how we're getting all the speed ups. So with that said, uh, going back to the uh, Graph optimizations, the memory bandwidth issue. Question? Uh, is there a license for MKL? So MKL, there is a license for, but MKL DNN is open source. Uh, that's kind of why we split it out. So a lot of these uh, optimizations are being made into NumPy, and NumPy is being sped up as well. So if you use the Intel distribution for Python, you get speed ups in scikit-learn, uh, NumPy, and a number of the other libraries that people commonly use. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty easy. You know, No big change to your code base. Just download the latest Intel Python, and you'll have access to all this. So uh, with the math that I said before, remember I said it's 17.2 gigabytes of uh, data. So basically what happens is that after you run the convolutional 2D operator, it has to write it out to a temporary variable because it can't fit in the cache. So it fits into RAM. So the problem is that you pay that cost twice because now you have to read it back from RAM between the operators, right? So you know, a row U is so ridiculously easy, right? It's just a max of 0 and x. Why don't you just do it in the operator itself, right? So rather than you know, making a whole trip to memory and back, why don't you just do the ReLU as you're doing the convolution and just write it out to memory once? So you should see quite a bit of speed up just because of that. System level optimizations uh, occurred because we just have so many cores, and you have to think about how to execute things efficiently. Um, there's basically two kinds of system level optimization. So the most common kind is you know, multiply two gigantic matrices, use lots of threads, break the matrices up, and you know, multiply them in some smart way. And uh, what that's called is it's called intra-op. So it's intra inside an operator. Basically, use many, many threads uh, and do you know, that convolution on MOS over you know, 128 batch size over gigantic images. And then the other kind is uh, maybe over sockets, what you want to do is you want to do what's called interop. So interop basically means run two independent operators in parallel. So each socket, you know, socket one might handle that, socket two might handle that one. Uh, just because we have so many sockets at the data, data center level, we can do this. So does that make sense so far? So to do this, um, a lot of these things are actually automated now. So when I first gave this talk uh, like three or four months ago, these weren't integrated into uh, TensorFlow. But our teams, our optimization teams, have been working very closely with Google. This is very quickly going to become the default. So it used to be in the very early versions, these are basically uh, MKLisms you know, coming from high-performance computing. 
used to have to set these, and uh, I'm going to tell you guys how to set these appropriately. But nowadays, if you just download TensorFlow and run it, uh, it'll basically pick you know pretty optimal values by itself already. Tuning will get you a little bit more performance, but uh, you know out of box performance is not too bad at all nowadays. So let me just give you an example. Uh, this is actually pretty old now because you know TensorFlow doesn't do this anymore. We used to use a library called Eigen, and Eigen was a, a matrix multiplication library. It's uh, like a basic linear algebra, you know, uh, like LinPack. And uh, when you do Eigen, the problem is that uh, how many people know about the global interpreter lock in Python? Yeah, the global interpreter lock basically serializes everything, makes everything non-parallel and really slow, right? So a lot of things in Python, people write C++ libraries around them using threading to get around the single-threaded nature, right? So Eigen is kind of falls victim to that. It, it's not completely that way, but because of the uh, you know the serialized nature, you see this TensorFlow timeline across all the cores here. There's a lot of waiting time between the jobs. And basically, this task here takes about eight seconds over here. And if you use the TensorFlow optimized version using MKLDNN, it basically finishes in about half a second here because it can use the threads more, uh, you know, um, in a better way. So, yeah, go ahead. Those uh, addition and uh, multiplication are those uh, characteristic? Uh, they, could there be other operations like greater than or less than? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There are, uh, you know, there's a couple common operations. Uh, obviously, matrix multiply. Involves multiply and addition. Uh, for rectified linear units, greater than or less than, you know, is obviously if it's less than zero, set it to zero. Otherwise, keep it as, you know, whatever it is. Uh, go ahead. Why is it mostly on like the CPU zero? <laughs> yeah, so these are not exactly CPU zero. I mean, it's, it's a funny form of what the timeline is showing. That's a very astute obs observation. Uh, but these are basically task executors. Uh, so when you set your interop, I think that, you know, that's uh, what these are running. So think about it as this is interop thread zero or socket zero. And then within that, there's a bunch of interops or intraops, right? So this could be each one of these could be using many, many threads at the same time within it. So it's a little bit misleading the way that you look at it. Uh, go ahead. So the, uh, so the TensorFlow, which is given by Intel, does not use Eigen. The TensorFlow by Intel mostly doesn't use Eigen nowadays. It's, we mostly patched out Eigen, uh, and that's because MKL DNN is so much more efficient. Yeah. So with that real file or whatever. Uh, there's still a wheel, so if you use Anaconda to install uh, TensorFlow, you will get the Intel optimized version. If you use the pip install, we're working on you know making the uh, the MKL DNN uh, version by default. Uh, but the uh, the Anaconda version is certainly the MKL DNN version. Yeah, we're making great you know progress on this. Uh, there's always you know changes, and there's always you know more optimizations we can do. But uh, you know it's it's getting much better. So you know there's some things you know setting the num threads up to like infinity is not going to help you. Uh, so how many of you guys are familiar with thrashing in systems? How many of you guys have ever heard of a fork bomb? Basically, you just keep forking, you keep spawning threads until you know the system can't handle it anymore. So what you really want to do is you want to set this to the number of cores that you have. If you set it too much higher, what ends up happening is that you end up thrashing. It's trying to juggle too many balls in the air, more balls than it can handle. So a lot of these things are actually in the uh, TensorFlow Performance Guide. Intel has worked very closely with Google uh, to basically spread our best practices uh, so that everyone can get the best performance out of Intel. Um, of course, you know, in this presentation, we talk about things like you know, disks and memory bandwidth and all that. They don't talk about that as much in detail. But you know, the basic ideas are here. So if you just uh, Google for you know, TensorFlow Performance Guide, you can find a lot of the recommendations there. So with that said, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a performance tutorial. Uh, we have a, a free cloud offering. So for many people, one of the difficulties is that you know training a deep neural network on a laptop doesn't cut it. Um, not everyone has more than 17.3 gigabytes of RAM, right? <laughs> so you know we have uh, a solution for you guys, uh, and it's called the Intel AI Developer Cloud, Dev Cloud. Those are 12 core machines with 96 gigabytes of RAM. So you can run many, many batches uh, at once, you know, without running out of memory. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you do performance optimization in the Intel AI Dev Cloud. Uh, one of the cool things is that we have uh, tools like uh, Intel VTune, which is about a $1,000 product. It's for free on the Dev Cloud. So if you guys want to get an account, you can get a 30-day account and uh, use that for performance optimization. So the, the link to the Intel AI Dev Cloud is just up here, ai.intel.com slash dev cloud. If you just Google for that, in, uh, Intel AI Dev Cloud, you can find uh, you know, the website for that. Sign up for a 30-day account. Uh, you can basically content install TensorFlow. This is already installed nowadays, but if you want the latest version, 1.11. We tend to keep a stable version because some researchers, they prefer 1.10. They don't want to change their code all the time. So, you know, we're not too far behind, but we don't want to change everything on the researchers who are using it currently. 
So you can, if you do Condensed on TensorFlow right now, you probably get 1.11 with even more Intel optimizations. We'll talk about three basic tools that you can use to look at CPU utilization and uh, you know, what are some characteristic signs of performance bottlenecks. So the first one will be HTOP, and then we'll talk about TensorFlow Timeline, which you saw a little bit earlier, and then we'll talk about VTAN. So HTOP, uh, if you get, have, has anyone used the Activity Monitor on a Mac or the System Monitor or Task Manager on Windows? So basically it's like that, right? HTOP is just a Unix equivalent, and it just shows you the CPU utilization of each CPU. Uh, this is a pretty beefy CPU here. We're, we're looking at 24 cores. Uh, some of them that I have worked with are 56 cores. Uh, and if you see a CPU utilization like this, where most of the bars are mostly full, that means that the CPU is pretty busy doing stuff. Um, sometimes it's a red herring. You know, being busy doesn't mean it's fast. So I'll tell you guys in a couple slides. Uh, but you know, in general, you're going you're to want the CPUs to be fairly busy versus fairly idle, right? So in this case, maybe it's waiting on disk. Maybe it's serializing. Maybe it's using Eigen in some way. You know, one of these is very, uh, you know, highly uh, utilized, but the other ones are not. Or maybe there's a global interpreter lock gremlin sitting there somewhere, right? <laughs> But generally, you know, this is a, a good workload, and generally you're seeing uh, good performance in this case over here. So to prepare the code for tuning, um, you know, as I said before, this has been automated, so this is really for the performance geeks out there. A lot of these things, you know, they'll just pick reasonable numbers. So the default TensorFlow now will just pick uh, intra-op, you know, uh, for each of the operators as the number of uh, physical cores that you have. So if you don't set it or if you set it to zero, it'll just set it to 12 for the dev cloud because that's how many cores we have. The interop is a little bit more complicated. That depends on topology. I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But usually, it's the number of sockets that you have in the machine, uh, because each socket, once again, is tightly coupled to memory. So, you know, if you have more than that, then it gets a little bit slower. So, there's a couple settings here called KMP block time, and uh, these are open MP settings. Uh, as I said, you know, this is part of MKL. You know, used for big scientific computing workloads. Usually, a block time of one means like wait one millisecond after a bunch of threads finish so that the system can cool down. You don't get thrashing after that. Uh, there's a couple things like granularity, fine, compact. That basically just means you know tied to the memory. Don't go to someone else's new memory. And then if you look at these uh, for the different kinds of topologies, uh, usually the optimal settings uh, for intraop and OMP num threads is just simply the number of cores that you have, uh, 12. And the interop depends on two things. It really depends on the number of sockets because you don't want to have uh, the interrupts running on more sockets than you have, otherwise you end up doing NUMA accesses or thrashing. The other thing is that if you look at the branching factor of each of these neural networks, VGG16 is very linear. It's layer after layer after layer. You don't really get much benefit by running these uh, operators in parallel because the operators are all very serial. Whereas for Inception V3 and ResNet50, uh, there's a little bit more of a branching factor there, and being able to run the operators in parallel helps a bit. So I, I don't think there's any crazy science to it, but I've already ever seen it be more than the, uh, the number of sockets. So with that said, I don't expect you guys to remember this. You guys can take a photo of it if you like, or it's already in the TensorFlow performance guide. But this is basically how you set up uh, TensorFlow for optimal you know, performance tweaking. Um, and what this includes is a little bit of VTune as well as TensorFlow timeline. So let me go through the lines uh, one at a time here. So this is just a very basic example of a ResNet 15 Keras, and it's getting a TensorFlow timeline, so you can see what's going on under the hood. So the first two lines are basically just your standard imports. Uh, one line is a comment. The second line basically just imports OS, Sys, Time, TensorFlow, and NumPy. The next batch of lines here just basically sets those variables. It basically just says, don't do NUMA accesses. You know, set my threading uh, pretty high so that I can use all the cores. And the next set here is basically setting up the, uh, the TensorFlow timeline. So this is setting on tracing. So it's going to slow things out, down a bit. Uh, but it's like, Heis it's like Heisenberg's principle, right? If you don't observe it, you, know, you don't disrupt it. But once you start observing it, then the bug goes away, right? <laughs> so, uh, basically, this just turns on tracing. And this is a standard ten TensorFlow option here. So we just turn on the uh, run options and run metadata for tracing. And uh, we ask for a full trace over here. So we just trace every operator that runs and what time it ran and for how long it ran. This is sort of the core of the code here. So I'm using Keras because Keras allows you to, uh, to basically instantiate a model with very few lines of code. In Keras, we have a ResNet 50 built in. I use a trick here called weights is equal to none. If you don't set weights, it'll basically download that 99 megabytes from the internet every time. But since I'm testing it, I don't really care. I'll just use an uninitialized uh, ResNet 50. I basically tell it to compile, use a standard SGD because it's a very simple one. I don't want you know, more variables to deal with here. I ask for you know, standard categorical cross entropy, and then I pass it the run options and run metadata up here. And then basically, uh, instead of reading data from the disk, I don't want the disk to basically slow down my, uh, my measurements or anything or create any jitter. 
I just create a gigantic array using numpy.zeros um, of the proper size, and basically it's training using uh, synthetic data. So this is very standalone. You don't have to download ImageNet or anything. You can just use synthetic data right here. When I set up uh, the session here, this is just a TensorFlow option. I can basically set the intraop and interop over here in the header, and then allow some soft placement, and then specify the config is equal to the config that I defined up there. And this is just telling TensorFlow, you use the config options that I defined up here, and uh, basically execute with those options. And then really the core of this code is really just three lines. Really, the first line is get the time. The second line is call model.fit, basically train for one epoch, and then basically get the time difference. So it's, these are the only three lines that actually do anything useful in the, in the code. After you do that, all it really is is that uh, we just import TensorFlow timeline, we just save it to the JSON file, and uh, later on we'll use Chrome to open this. And then finally, it's just some uh, you know, uh, code to, to wrap this all in a command line wrapper so that when you call it and pass the arguments in here, it just reads the arguments and calls the function up there. Does that make sense? It seems like a lot, but it's really just three lines of code up there. A lot of it is just set up. And if you're not tuning it, if you're just using, using the Intel defaults, you don't even need to set these for the most part. You can just you know, use the TensorFlow timeline right there. So with the timeline traces, the timeline format is just a JSON format. It's actually really easy to write a parser. I did one about 10 lines of Python. Uh, Google Chrome will allow you to visualize it fairly nicely. So if you have Google Chrome, I think that's the only browser that I've seen so far that's able to read the format. Um, but you basically just open up Chrome, colon slash slash tracing, and then hit load. And then uh, basically just select timeline.json, and then this will show up. So what you're looking for, uh, probably in this slide, is that when you open it up, you'll see two things. You'll see that a number of blocks here are colored you know, purple here, and that would be the forward pass. And a number of blocks here are covered, colored like teal or uh, you know, greenish, and that would be the backward pass there. Of course, when you do training, you always need the forward pass and then followed by the backward pass, right? And if you look down here, you can see where the time is being spent. And uh, you know, 44 seconds per epoch seems like an awfully long time. That's not very good. I specifically picked this example because I found a bug in Keras, actually, as a result of making this presentation. And I was able to make Keras several times faster by reporting the bug and uh, having them fix it. <laughs> so you'll see that batch storm here, actually, accounts for a large amount of the time. It's almost like if you add these numbers up, 44 plus 38 and, and so, it adds up to almost 101 seconds. Basically, what was happening is that Keras, being a multi-framework, uh, you know, high-level interface, it also works with CNTK, it also works with TNO, it also works with, I think, MX and a num number of other interfaces. What happens is that they call the most generic operator and not the most specific optimized operator. Um, so, as I said before, when you have fusion, you don't have a trip back and forth to memory. But basically, they were calling the non-fused version of BatchStorm. And as soon as I told them, hey, you know, why don't you switch to the fused version, 101 dropped down to 7.3 seconds. So that was an extreme you know, uh, optimization. And uh, this was, I think, like two months after I joined Intel. So the optimization teams were like, oh, wow, you did that already <laughs> so, in one presentation. So yeah, we made, a, we made it quite a bit faster, almost like 10 times faster, or maybe even more. So with that said, uh, you know, that, I think TensorFlow Timeline is a great tool. It really tells you where the bottlenecks could be. I, uh, I actually run a inner BU performance optimization group. I work with different Intel teams, find bugs in their performance, and I report it to them. And uh, there are many, but I think we've, we've made some good progress now. Uh, so things are much, much faster in the, uh, in the latest editions. With that said, another tool that I like to use in this uh, optimization team is uh, VTune. So VTune is commonly used by people in the HPC space or maybe people writing software, trying to get the best performance out of things like you know, uh, multiply matrices or maybe uh, game developers you know, trying to get the best performance. Um, and VTune actually uses a number of hardware performance counters actually built in the silicon, so I can see how many cache misses you have, you know, how many stalls and all that kind of stuff. Um, so VTune will basically parse that out and see you know, like where the, uh, the least optimal parts are and tell you. It's a very coarse tool. It won't tell you exactly what operator, but it'll tell you, you know, what kind of performance problems you're having. So in this case, um, if you want to run VTune on the dev cloud, you just simply uh, create an environment and then uh, call the script over here. This will source in all the uh, environment variables that you need. And then you just simply call the VTune tool over here, and then uh, it'll basically produce an output file. So I'll give you guys a second if you want to take a photo of that. Now, the unfortunate thing is that VTune has an X11 GUI. We don't have X11 in the dev cloud. So oftentimes what I do is I run the uh, VTune in the dev cloud and then copy to my laptop and look at the trace. So I'll show you guys some examples of traces here. 
So this is one uh, output of V2 in here, and this is just kind of the simplified output. So what it's showing is that in my non-optimized version, I do a lot of NUMA accesses. Like 34% of the time, it's going to another CPU's memory. Uh, that's an extremely expensive operation. It's slowing me down right there. So the, the fix for that is to call NUMA control minus P, which forces it, pins it to the, you know, one CPU socket. And then the other thing that I noticed is that it's using quite a bit of 512-bit instructions, which is great because 512-bit is the neural net network accelerator instruction. So you know, if you're not using this, you're not getting the full performance out of your Intel CPU. Uh, so basically, the fact that it's using a lot of 512 is a good thing. If I can get it up to 100%, it's good. But the problem is that there's other libraries like the JPEG decode library. There's other libraries that are decoding movies and all that that are still using Eigen and still using older libraries. So we'd have to upgrade everything. Um, you know, so Intel is certainly you know, working with those, uh, those owners and you know, trying to upgrade everything that we can. Uh, but it's almost impossible to get it up to 100% because not all the code is within TensorFlow itself. So another thing is that uh, the VTune tool will tell you a little bit about where you need to optimize. So for example, it'll show you how much time you're spending in serial code. Are you like hitting a global interpreter lock somewhere? Uh, it'll show you how much time you spend in the parallel region and what is the potential gain. It'll also show you like uh, which files and which operators is spending its time in. So you can kind of figure out is it a value operator or a batch storm, you know, what is spending its time. Oftentimes it's a little bit better to use the TensorFlow timeline because that's more fine grained, but VTune will tell you that anyhow. So VTune is not really free. It is free for students. Um, but if you're a developer and you no longer have access to a .edu email, uh, you can get this thing called Application Performance Snapshot. So that's a light version of VTune. It'll basically give you a similar output like that, but without the GUI. Um, and it runs on Windows, Linux, and I think even Macintosh. Um, so you can get uh, pretty decent you know, performance uh, statistics using just uh, APS here. So it's just called the Application Performance Snapshot. It's part of VTune. It's the free version. So I'll show you guys a couple uh, examples here. So when you run APS, uh, rather than giving you a textual output or a GUI, it produces an HTML file, and the HTML file looks just like this. Uh, this is basically uh, run with the batch storm on, with the batch size of 64 and 8 threads. And as you can see, it's like spending a lot of time in the memory stalls here. Uh, the FPU utilization is like 2%. It's pretty abysmal. Uh, you can see that it's using a ton of scalar instructions. So it's literally like, you know, read in one floating point, multiply, read another one, and multiply instead of vectorizing it. Um, and that's because the batch storm there is using Eigen. Uh, so this is like a telltale sign that it's you know, not using the optimized Intel MKL library. So I reported this, uh, reported this to, the, uh, to the performance team. And uh, we went down from 86 seconds all the way down to 14 seconds by doing that. So this is basically just disabling batch storm. The 512 bit, we're using 99% of it now. Now it's calling almost all MKL DNN. Our FPU utilization is still 22%. I mean, that's better. This is like an eight teraflop system, so we're still, you know, not getting the whole thing. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, the, what exactly was done to utilize that? Like, like so, the problem is that Batch Storm is calling the old Eigen library, and it's not calling the MKL DNN library. And the MKL DNN library fuses the operators, so you don't make multiple trips to memory. And it also uh, doesn't use scalar instructions; it uses the uh, the accelerated 512-bit instructions. Combined with Eigen, or did you replace Eigen? Or what? Uh, no, no. So actually, what I did was we modified Keras. Uh, so Keras itself inserts a bunch of batch storm operators there, and we just commented those out. Um, so if you read the TensorFlow performance guide, it says actually for LSTMs, you know, you can run batch storm on LSTMs, uh, but oftentimes the batch storm actually slows it down so much that you reach the fastest convergence just by disabling batch storm and then having it run more epochs. So this is a convolutional network. It's not the same as the LSTM, but I'm just saying that in some cases, you know, batch storm for as good as it is, uh, you know, for certain kinds of networks, it slows it down so much that you're actually better off not running it. Um, so I mean, the theories are great. You know, there's some criticisms of batch storm, but you know, in practice, when you have so many CPUs and so many cores and you know, such an architecture, it's not clear sometimes whether it's actually better to have that on or off. So you might want to try it both ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this, this actually, this bug, I spent several weeks debugging it because I wasn't sure. I said, why in the world is ResNet 50 so slow? So this is a, this is a great experience, experience in how you would actually run such a, a program. So you can put this all together. Uh, there are scripts on Intel's website where you can basically put together the TensorFlow timeline and also the VTune results and then view that in a single view. Um, I don't use this often because most of the time I can figure it out from just the, uh, the TensorFlow timeline. Uh, but this is a useful way to debug and see what's going on. So with that said, you know, there's a number of performance pathologies. You know, some are simple, some are less obvious. The simplest ones are just, you know, your disk or I.O. is just too slow. And uh, 
you know, just simply use the you know, multi-threading and the right you know, TF data loading APIs. We actually saw a case where uh, you know, people were calling like Pillow you know, serially and it was just hitting the global interpreter lock and uh, it was slowing things down a lot. So basically once you start using these and doing things in parallel, it basically speeds up almost by uh, a factor of the number of cores because that's how many more cores you use. Uh, a lot of things are compute bound. You know, as we know, machine learning is heavily compute bound. But one thing that I didn't appreciate at first when I first you know, started making these slides is uh, you know, how much memory boundedness really matters. And once you do the math, you actually see that the memory bandwidth is a, is a huge part of the issue. So we're clearly putting in faster memory, HPM2, you know, GDDR6, that kind of RAM uh, to speed things up. Uh, they, they don't come without a cost, though. You know, that's extremely expensive memory. That's only you know, on the higher end parts. Uh, so we're trying to you know, do things where you can use DDR4 and use a smaller data type uh, using bfloat16, which is a, an abbreviated version of float32, and essentially get double the memory bandwidth and basically double the performance with cheaper RAM. So there's a lot of cool things that are done there. Um, also on the Bovidius Compute Sticks, I think we're doing int8. A lot of it is int8, so that's four times smaller than a float32. So you basically get almost four times the performance because it's so bandwidth bound, uh, just by using a smaller data type. So for things that are memory bandwidth bound, we have to do pin processing. Um, many of you, if you're not using a cluster, you don't have to do that. But you know, it's not so obvious that pinning uh, a process to a certain kind of memory and uh, pinning the DRAM and the, uh, the processor together makes a big difference. So with that said, uh, a summary of this is that you know, there's a performance guide from Google. Uh, just following that uh, performance guide that we work together with them on uh, helps a lot. Uh, V2 and TensorFlow Timeline are great things to help understand your bottlenecks. If you guys are coming out with new operators like Winograd or you know, like uh, spatially uh, depth separable convolutions or something that doesn't already exist in TensorFlow as part of research, this might be useful. If you guys are just calling standard convolution in RELU, we probably already optimized it. So you know, for the researchers out there, and if you see a performance problem, feel free to ping us at Intel. And we, you know, we'd be happy to optimize that operator for you guys. Uh, there's a number of op options that you can set. And uh, if you see any bottlenecks or slow ops, I'm sure that there's a lot of code out there. You know, just please do let our Intel team know, you know when you see something that isn't performing uh, well. And uh, we'll try to fix that for you guys. So with that said, I want to you know, bring the conversation back to this idea of performance, you know, raw performance per clock time, performance per watt, and performance per dollar. Um, what matters, and if you were designing hardware, how would you design the hardware differently to optimize for these? So I just open it up as a question to you guys. Yeah, thank you. So what do you guys think? What, what matters for you guys? Or it depends on the use case. Per dollar is a, is a big yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, 100 bucks, you get a lot of performance out of that. Stuff. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's why uh, we're trying to enable the Intel GPU, uh, to, you know, via OpenCL and all that to support frameworks like TensorFlow. And uh, many of you guys, actually, pretty much all of you already own a GPU. So, you know, the GPUs will get better in the next gen. Um, one of the benefits of the Intel GPU is that it's already built in. The drawback, though, is that it basically, because of cost and power savings, it reuses the DDR4 RAM on your machine. Whereas a lot of the uh, you know the more discrete GPUs have GDDR6, which is two to three times faster. So you do pay a cost. You do you know you pay extra power. So this guy actually has a GTX 1050 in there. When I turn around, it's about three hours of battery life. When it's using the Intel GPU, it's more like six or seven hours. So you do certainly pay a, a performance uh, a battery penalty for the the discrete one. So other thoughts. So, uh, go ahead. I mean, performance with reference to block time is also important. Yeah, they're all important. Yeah. I mean, this guy can do it in real time once again. Um, but I mean, that's only for inference and not training. So, you know, we're trying to go for raw speed. The way to get raw speed is that it's actually not terribly hard. It's just really the number of execution units. If you have enough cores, things will work out. So there's really only two things limiting you, right? The number of FPU units and the memory bandwidth. Um, and if you get enough you know, accelerator cards or if you get enough cores, you eventually reach that point. The question is, can you hit performance per dollar doing the same thing? So it's really funny because uh, almost everything nowadays is because everything has to scale up past one node or one socket. Almost everything is in the interconnect nowadays. <laughs> you know, you can only put so much logic on a silicon die before your, your defect rate goes too high. Uh, go ahead. Uh, do you think the basics will eventually replace CPUs for training and then? So this is a very interesting question, and we've thought about this for a long time. 
So I don't think there's a lot of good data points aside from one called Bitcoin. <laughs> so if you look at Bitcoin, you know, it began in CPUs because CPUs are easy to program, easy to debug, and easy to work with, right? And then eventually kind of moved to GPUs because GPUs are massively parallel. You know, there's gaming cards that are very cheap. And then eventually the FPGA guys got a wind of it, right? So the FPGA guys dev designed it and uh, synthesized it in FPGAs. And nowadays, even the FPGAs aren't selling anymore. Now it's become ASICs. So, you know, Bitcoin mining is a very specific application, right? You know, there's a very specific set of operators that you do to mine a Bitcoin, right? With deep learning, I think it mostly is, you know, just matrix multiplying convolutions. Uh, but, you know, in the 30 years that Jude has looked at, you know, maybe the operations are a little bit different. Maybe they're more efficient one way or another. Uh, so I think it really just depends on the nature of the operation because once you have an ASIC, you've locked yourself down to a particular design. So if you look at things like TensorRT, you know, NVIDIA's example, um, they have four by four matrices. So if it's not four by four, if it's three by three, now you're wasting part of the silicon. If it's five by five, now it doesn't fit. You know, I'm sure they did a whole bunch of market research and a whole bunch of topologies to find that four by four is kind of an optimal size. Um, so I think a lot of these, you know, uh, in a lot of the discussions that I've been hearing is really the question between, you know, generic versus specific hardware, right? And this goes in waves all the time. So in the 90s, Yann LeCun, you know, when he built his first uh, LA net, he actually built hardware to do, the, to do the convolutions, right? But that hardware didn't really live on forever. Um, and many, many times in Intel's history, you know, people have built specialized hardware that did things, you know, very well, but oftentimes the price point wasn't correct. So in a recent uh, talk that I've been to uh, from Intel Labs, they were saying that, you know, these things can kind of exist for a small amount of time, but if it's too specific and that use case goes away, that hardware will end up disappearing. Um, so a lot of the design of Intel's, uh, you know, software and the whole hardware stack is really trying to, if I can do something very specific, but with just two or three cycles of, you know, a generic instruction set, I will do that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, don't forget, Intel not only makes CPUs, but we also make GPUs, and we also sell FPGAs, and we also make VPUs and a number of other things. So even within Intel, I don't think there's any necessarily uh, one group that wins for all time. You know, CPUs are more generic, and usually I think it's more of a migration from CPU-like to GPU-like SIMD to FPGA to ASICs, you know, as, uh, as the use case kind of, you know, hashes itself out over time. So I think for deep learning, we're getting much closer to, you know, basically this is a, basically a deep learning ASIC that you guys are holding right here. It was hardware for the perceptron yeah, that exactly. Rosenblatt That's made right. in the, before I was born, actually, and there's a video I saw it recently of it, so. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if someone just burned like a ResNet 50 or like a, you know, like a mobile nets or something just in silicon, just because it, it's so much more efficient. But the problem is that once you do that, the next net comes out, yeah. then you have to do it all over again. So I, I think Microsoft and Project Brainwave they bought a whole ton of Altera FPGAs from Intel. You know, they got pretty good performance out of that. But I think you know, I think really what's going to drive it is once the innovation slows down and once we kind of standardize on the, on the networks and we're no longer inventing new networks and new operators all the time, then an ASIC starts making more sense. And that, that's the same with Bitcoin, right? They're not inventing new mathematics you know, for Bitcoin all the time. So it, luckily, it's such a, a dynamic and vibrant space that you guys are doing such great work that you know, we can't even keep up with whatever network of the year it is anymore. And I hope that continues for a long time, because that's you know, great innovation. There's a keynote at four, so we were kind of aiming to finish this so people could go to that, uh, which I think is just in the big room there. But, uh, but if you want to ask some, so people f feel free to leave. And, you know, if you run into light, or we can stay around and ask some, ask some more, answer some more questions. Well, thank you guys very much.